All right, let's get this show on the road. A lot to talk about this week, and I will jump right into it. Uh, first off, about 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago, um, my friend uh, Stefan Goodchild in the UK did a little bit of artwork. It was a line drawing of Delia Derbyshire in the in the famous photo where she's leaned over the tape decks. I put it out as a t-shirt and it was hugely popular. We just uh this is before she was she's really became the demi goddess that we know today. Uh so I didn't I would thought we'd sell a couple and uh it was hundreds. And uh it uh, was g- quite a burden, actually, is one of those things where where uh, uh, it was a little too successful. Um, in any event, I, uh, Stefan and I also did uh, a Pierre Schaefer and a Edgar Verace, Verace, Verace? I, I don't know. I didn't go to fucking college. I don't know how to say this dude's name. Ed- Edgar Verace um, t-shirts to go with it. And then uh, I moved, and so I had to put the T-shirt thing on hiatus. And then, uh, in a bizarre uh, coincidence, both Stefan and I lost the artwork for the T-shirt, so I couldn't have them remade. And over the intervening years, hundreds, thousands, I don't know, a lot of people have asked me when I was bringing those shirts back. And... uh, Lo and behold, last week, Stefan found the artwork on an old hard drive. He was looking for some songs, and he found a drive that happened to have uh, the original Illustrator files for these T-shirts. So uh, I immediately put them in Printful, and uh, they are now available again. So if you would like a brand new Delia Derbyshire shirt. We have, we have the the uh, young and adorable Delia Derbyshire, or the suave and debonair Pierre Schaefer, or the grumpy and judgmental Edgar Varese. To uh, so you got one for every mood. <laughs> Anyhow, those are in my Printful store, and they will uh, they will be there forevermore. So you don't have, we don't have since that's on demand. Uh, I have quite a few Printful shirts. I've I use them to make shirts for myself uh, because I have a business account. I can make samples, so I can make one offs, and uh, and I've sold quite a few of them as well. And I'm very happy with there. It's a die sub printing. Uh, that it, that's just hangs around forever. The shirts are, are great. I, I'm and uh, anyone that knows me knows I'm super picky about that sort of thing. Uh, silk screen companies run screaming when they see me coming because I'm so anal retentive about that very subject, and I'm quite happy with the printful shirts. So this is not an advertisement for them. Believe me, uh, there are a million on-demand places. That happens to be the one I like. Uh, next up, I f- somehow neglected to mention this last week, but I have a new record out. Uh, it's called Depth of Field. It is nine tracks on triplicate records. Link in the description. Um, it is a uh, exploration of music by other means, I suppose. Uh, there are no synthesizers on it. The only one is... Uh, I just wonder if I feel like standing up and grabbing it. The, the Mute Synth uh, version 4 makes a little ticky sound in one track, but otherwise it's all uh, guitar, bass, uh, xylophone, that sort of th- uh, roads, a lot of roads on there. It, um, and I'm using these instruments to fill the space that I would normally fill with synth, so there's a lot of effects. And it's an ambient record. Uh, I'm very pleased with it, and uh, I... Be happy if you went and gave it a gave it a whirl. Um, but up, 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 up. and that's it for me for the week. Uh, otherwise, it was just normal work. Um, there was some exciting new gear coming out, but frankly, you know, I I just I couldn't really pay attention to the amount necessary to talk about it with any sort of authority. Uh, 
So uh, I won't be <laughs> doing that. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about this week was the fact that I am undergoing a um, a mental breakdown. Is that the right word? <laughs> I don't. No, I don't want to cast light on people that have actual mental problems. I do not. Well, uh, other people might have a different opinion on that, but uh, I've used live now for about almost exclusively to make music for about 10 years uh and i am i hate to say this out loud because i have a lot of friends that work at ableton but i am thinking of going all in on bitwig uh i finally i i pride myself in being fairly ecumenical with with respect to digital audio workstations it shouldn't really matter the computer or the or the software, uh, you should be able to sit down in front of anything and make music with it. Uh, and I am one of the sorts that is theoretically capable of doing that. I have most of the big DAWs, um, just by virtue of or of uh, working for Audio Damage. Um, so I can use anything really. The uh, over the last few years, I've been using Bitwig more and more. As I've mentioned in previous videos, I used it. Uh, I use it almost exclusively during development just because of the, the nature of its construction makes it very good for that. Um, and because it's always open and uh, I end up recording noodles in it while I'm doing dev, uh, I've ended up just through circumstance using it to make music. And I've been doing that more and more uh, to the point where I believe I am going all in on Bitwig. Uh, this is a strange thing because uh, I'm a strong proponent of the studio as instrument. Uh, nowadays, that's not such a strange thing. But when I was coming up, to write in the studio was hugely expensive. And I have the seven-figure album budgets to prove it. I would write in a proper recording studio, and uh, which is stupid. But um, so I'm very comfortable writing recording and producing all at the same time and it seems to me that bitwig is mostly made for that mentality uh the fact that there is less demarcation between uh the mix environment the arranging environment and the recording environment than in most DAWs uh really appeals to me and uh, well, we're going to see how it feels. I'm just going to use it for the foreseeable future, and either that works out or it doesn't. Um, I'm really liking some of the clever bits I'm finding in it now that I'm using it almost exclusively for music. So uh, one of the things that is super important to me when uh, I'm all in on a DAW, when it becomes my instrument, is uh, hardware integration. The... Uh, when, in the unlikely event I am performing live, I want to have a controller to where I can comfortably control the DAW without seeing it, without having to look at the computer. Uh, so that it has to be enough integration for it to pass me information uh, to keep my comfort level high so I can worry about other things on stage. Uh, when I'm in the studio, I obviously want to be able to haul the controller around to the various locations. I have three uh, kind of areas where I work. You know, there's the, the big keyboards, there's my computer, there's where the roads and the, and whatever keyboard of the month I have is, uh, and there's my Instagram table. I want to be able to take the controller to those locations um, and leave the main computer sitting here, obviously. So... Uh, one thing Bitwig has is the ability to utilize a lot of different hardware controls, controllers at a high level of integration. Uh, it's a fully scriptable DAW. You can, uh, you can kind of make anything control anything via, via scripting. Uh, it has, in my opinion, its integration with the Push 2 is better than Ableton's. Uh, it's a, it's different, but uh, I think it's more usable. 
so that is that's one selling factor for me uh, that uh, there's a, a company Nectar. Actually, I have. I don't know why the fuck I'm pointing at me. They're not on camera. I have a Nectar Pacer that they sent me to test uh, control of Enso of our Looper plugin, and uh, it kind of just sat under my couch for a long time, and then. Recently, I pulled it out and started using it for its job, which is controlling Bitwig, uh, and it's very good at it. Um, to the point where I'm actually more comfortable not looking at the computer at all and just hitting the foot pedals to and sitting here playing, uh, and uh, that's really nice. And they make several other controllers in their Panorama series that are uh, that have full Bitwig integration. So I'm gonna. Assuming I actually go all, I wish they had a grid like uh, like the Push Two. But uh, aside from that, I think assuming I go, you know, fully all in on Bitwig, I'm going to be exploring the Nectar range of products. I, you know, I suppose we'll see how that works out. All right, and that brings us to questions uh first up this week from joel corvo uh who's your most frustrating child which ad software plugin was the biggest pain in the ass that's an interesting question i would actually uh enso was very difficult there are uh like on the face of it making a, a looper plugin seems kind of simple you just fill a buffer with what's coming in and then you play it back in a loop there are so many corner cases in uh, good looping software. And uh, we've got the majority of them nailed in Enso, but they're still cropping up, you know, two years after the fact. That was a, a real bear to drag out. I think, I don't know if that was our most difficult, but it was definitely very difficult. Adam has a different perspective on this than me because UI problems are not deal breakers generally they affect the sales of the plugin but they don't really affect the plugin itself the uh, uh his area is the dsp and that uh was a real nightmare in and so i know that um i can't say if it was the worst but it was definitely difficult the one we're working on now is another bear it has a lot of uh things we had to invent like there's the kind of plugin you can make by just putting together off-the-shelf pieces, stuff that already exists, and then there's the kind where you have to, where you have to whittle everything. Some stuff doesn't exist at all anywhere. So, uh, uh, and this plugin we're about to release is is in that vein. So, uh, it has taken much longer than I thought it would, to be honest with you. But uh, we're moving along. You know, all things uh, all things in time. And a follow-up question, is there an audio damage plugin that deserved to be more successful or popular than it was? That is not for me to say. Uh, I don't determine a product's success or popularity beyond making it as good as, as we are capable of making it. Uh, having said that, there's stuff I wish would have been better appreciated and stuff that I'm surprised that is still in our catalog. Um, I'm not going to speak ill of any of our babies. I love them all equally. Um, but uh, like Continua is a hugely sophisticated synthesizer. I don't know how to market it because it's it, on the face of it, it's just a three octave or three oscillator subtractive. So, uh, like that, I feel, should be more successful than it is. Um, but on the whole, the products that are very good sell very well. The products that are not very good don't sell very well. That's the, the public is, for their many, many failings, a fairly good judge of a, a product's potential success. All right, Nicholas Vinning. Is that Vinning or Vining? I don't actually know. He can tell me later. 
How are you handling monitoring? How blah, blah, blah. how are you handling monitoring with your new Dante rig when recording? I'm currently doing a messy analog zero latency monitor thing, but I'm curious if any of your shiny focus rate makes it any better. Well, one of the reasons to use Dante is the very very low latency. Uh, my system without any shenanigans of any sort. I haven't tuned this computer in any way. Uh, it runs at five milliseconds round trip. So, which is just maybe a millisecond more than the speed of the AD converters and the USB translate or and the uh, PCI translation. So, uh, it's as quick as it can get, really, uh, unless your converters are. I don't even fucking know. FPGA? I, I have no idea. Uh, so I can actually stack several effects that are making multiple round trips and not really feel it in the plane. If I'm just playing a synth, I don't feel it at all. It might be a result of having played to computers for 30 years that I'm just used to latency and I myself compensate for it. But uh, I don't feel my current rig at all. So monitor, monitor, monitoring is, is fairly simple. There's just uh, two of the Dante outputs are assigned to these Atom speakers, and that's that. Uh, the matrix, I can actually show you the matrix here. Um, this is the Dante controller. So it shows uh, all of your inputs and all of your outputs, and I have a lot of them. And you can see them all and, and, and hook them all up however you want. This, these two little guys here, can you even see that? You can't see that at all. Yeah, just trust me, they're on there. Like uh, that's, this here is by itself. This is my headphone amp. I can carry this. I have it on a long Cat5 and I can carry it anywhere in the room. I actually have two of these. Uh, one of the problems with monitoring on a Dante system is that a any two endpoints can only have one source a source can go to any endpoint and all endpoints i could i could select the output of this computer output one and assign it to every single output in in this and this and any other dante shit i have hooked up but the speakers can only have one source so it's like the old days when you uh your ASIO driver took over your computer, and that was that. That's how Dante works. Focusrite, there's a couple products that get around this. Focusrite just released this R1, which I'm very excited about. There haven't been any available for purchase yet, but the second one is on this continent. It's coming home with me. Um, essentially, it has a 12 by 12 matrix in it, and you can... Uh, it's a it just shows up in the dante controller as a uh as a 12 in 12 or 30 i don't know 32 in 12 out something like that it just shows up in the dante controller as ins and outs and those outs can go anywhere and you can mix so it's a it's basically a dante mixer but it is wearing monitor control clothes so the point of it is to is to uh have multiple monitor rigs for surround sound systems but since i'm only running stereo it'll allow me the main thing it'll allow me to do is mix the windows media output my daw output the other four computers i have on my dante star uh all down to headphones this guy and my speakers so uh, i'm super excited for that it's really a it probably takes a noticeable chunk of my day to redo the matrix when I'm switching computers, and this will get rid of all of those problems. So I'm really looking forward to getting to getting it, and uh, and uh, I can't wait till it's available. Uh, bonus question: Do we still care about out of the box mixing? No, not really. Uh, I know this was a big thing. It was a big thing back in the day. Um, now, I don't know that I. <laughs> I used to really care about about the uh, the mix. Now I kind of left leave let other people worry about that and mix and the mastering. Um. Uh, yeah, sure. It'd be nice to have a Neve sidecar here that you do your mix on. Whatever. 
of course that'd be nice if it makes you happy you make better music if you're happy right uh doing the mix in here and dumping it to my mtr 10 makes me just as happy so uh you know michael southard asks your music always seems to sound fresh and new oh thank you i wouldn't necessarily agree with that but um, while still retaining your own unique, unique artistic voice, what elements do you think help you accomplish this? Uh, the principal element is, you know, 35 years of experience, really. Uh, I can quickly turn an idea into a full song if I so desire. Um, just by virtue of experience, you know, you get, you do anything for that long, you're going to get good at it. Um, my unique voice is a result of only playing my own music and hardly ever, like, I used to be really worried about being able to play, you know, other people's songs. And that's how I learned how to play keyboards was figuring out other songs, uh, transcribing them. Um, nowadays I only play my own music, so it amplifies amplifies my own voice to where I have the kind of keyboard style you can pick out of a lineup. Is it that good? No, no, it is not. I'm not a good keyboard player. Uh, it is however unique to me. I can't just show up at a jam session and, and, you know, fucking throw down on, on I wish or, or something. But on the other hand, when you hear a song and I'm playing on it, you generally know it's me. And I think that's about the most any musician can reasonably ask, I think. All right. Clement Kodar, monitor, minute, he wrote miniters, miniters and screens, curves, 4K, or both. Both. Uh, I think for anything smaller than about 27 inches, curved is a gimmick. It doesn't really work right. Uh, but for a bigger monitor, 32 or up, curved is so helpful. Uh, I have this one on a gas arm, so I can I can turn it however I need it to be. Uh, I can raise it way up, you know, or bring it way down. So that's uh, super handy if I want to play standing up or whatever. Uh, when I'm working, because I'm fucking old, I have trifocals or whatever the fuck, I have to lean my head back. To, to get through the magnifying lenses for the reading. Uh, but because I have it on the gas arm, I can put it super low or make the text real big or whatever the fuck. And that's, it's just easier on me physically. Uh, the curved one makes my peripheral vision work better. It, the curve takes a little getting used to. When I first got it, I wasn't too sure. Uh, but now flat monitors look stupid to me. Um, and 4K, that's a no-brainer. It's just... Uh, better in every respect. Um, it's funny. I like. I just have a no non high DPI monitor policy in this house now. We just replaced our TV because it wasn't 4K, <laughs> and I couldn't stand it. <laughs> Fucking pixels on the thing anymore. Um, even after having a well tuned 4K large 4K monitor on a Windows system and knowing how to get the most out of it, uh, retina starts looking kind of shitty because retina is pixel doubling and, uh, and it just kind of looks assy and smooth and, and, and uh, milky. Whereas uh, I'm now very used to the ultra sharp uh, Windows high, P high DPI modes. Uh, that takes some tuning and knowledge and uh, you can't skimp on the video cards. I have a, a RTX 2080 in this. You know, it's just like shit like that. Uh, there's no doing that halfway. You can't just throw a little curve 4K monitor on your on your, you know, i5 dual dual processor i5 with Intel onboard graphics and expect it to be the bomb. It's not gonna be. But if you make the investment in time and effort and knowledge, uh, it returns really good results. Uh, probably the best bang for your buck in computer land, but it is not obvious at first. Uh, this is so easy on my eyes and uh, enjoyable to use, and I've got the color balance very well tuned for my needs, and uh, it makes working a pleasure, a pleasure instead of a struggle. 
and uh, that's a big deal and that's worth time and money for me and i think that about covers it so we will uh catch you on the flip side smash that doorknob bring that buzzer whatever the fuck hit up my patreon if you want to answer ask the questions talk to you later